We've got Dr. Mary Ruth Hackett, who's coming all the way from Phoenix, Arizona. So I, to be honest with you guys, I have not had the pleasure before today of meeting uh, Dr. Mary Ruth, but we haven't been in conversation. And I was introduced to herself through the Blessed Is She Network and my role as Marriage and Family Life Director. I keep tabs and all the goings on of uh, parenting and stuff. And Blessed Is She is a unique ministry and um, just saw some of her content in through that website and then got deeper in her content. She is an amazing resource out in Arizona. She has a doctorate in educational psychology in, in addition to being a mom of four. So some really specialized talent uh, coming in. And she also is the host of the Parenting Smarts podcast that is operating on behalf of the Diocese of Phoenix. She has her own website, Parenting with Peer Review, combining best practices of lived experience with the peer-reviewed studies and how they uh, work together. Um, and speaking of being a soccer nut, as we connected on Facebook, I, I see that her son is a very, very talented, burgeoning, uh, burgeoning soccer player. So I'm on team uh, Hackett <laughs> from afar. And uh, anyhow, we're just very ple uh, pleased to welcome her. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Ruth Hackett. Thank you for that introduction. And, and yes, Chaz, I have to say that we are Chelsea fans in our house. So when you mentioned Liverpool, I thought, okay, we're just, maybe we'll say something, maybe we won't. And um, yeah, all four of my kiddos play soccer. So I've got two of them on the pitch right now. And I keep getting dinged with the little updates on what's going on with, with one of my daughter's games. But I'm really happy to be here and not be on a soccer field for once for a Saturday morning so that I can share with you all, wherever you're listening in from. Um, in the next hour, I'm gonna address how we can really proclaim the gospel to our children and transmit the faith in a way that will be lasting. And I'm gonna do this based off of research, what we actually know from people who study this for a living. I'm gonna talk also about some various constructs in child development and concepts in psychology that will help you to really develop a deeper understanding of how your kids think, how your kids grow, and how your kids are influenced. Now, as Ches mentioned, my doctorate is not in theology, it's in educational psychology and lifespan human development. So I'm coming from a slightly different place than a lot of the speakers that you would typically hear in a conference like this. My hope though, is that I can help you come to a better understanding of the psychology of your child so that you can make better decisions in the moment really practical parenting choices in the moment. Because there's no manual, there's no guide, there's no talk that is gonna tell you how to best parent your child. Parenting is an interaction between two people. It's dyadic in nature and every dyad is going to differ. So I'm not gonna tell you at what age your children should start sleeping in their own rooms or whether you should be a stay-at-home mom or work outside the home pursuing a professional career or at what age your kids should get a cell phone or have sleepovers or start dating. Every dyad and every family is gonna to need to handle those issues slightly differently. However, we have a lot of things in common and children develop along the same general trajectory. So we're gonna be discussing today those common things and I'll be equipping, equipping you with a better understanding so that you can apply that knowledge in the moment. Now, the specifics of the role of a parent and even the role of the family is going to change as your child grows. But we as parents living by the faith, being relationship focused, um, set the family culture. And we set forth certain, um, as, act as a model or a guide for children irrespective of, of their age or stage. Now, the two other speakers are addressing the importance of keeping Christ at the center of everything and talking about the importance of your own spirituality as a parent. My lack of a focus on those things should not be taken as a sign as they don't matter because they do matter incredibly so, which is why we have entire talks devoted just to those, those subjects. I'm really gonna focus on the development of your child's understanding of faith because that's what my specialty is, parenting and developmental psychology. And then we're gonna talk about how to um, present, I'm gonna present some things outside the obvious, I hope, um, that you can learn from as you try to transmit the faith. And I wanna give you a disclaimer before I go any further as we discuss these things, because as Ches mentioned, people don't like hearing uh, about parenting and what they're doing right or what they're doing wrong even. Um, I want you to just listen today, to take the information in and then decide, is this something that I can really apply now 
or is it maybe something I should hold for later? Because nothing that I say is going to be, uh, no matter how solid the research is, nothing I say is gonna be applicable to 100% of parents 100% of the time. But you might find that something that seems completely unapplicable to you today is actually exactly what you need a month down the road. Because as you know, with parenting, things change dramatically and they change overnight sometimes. So let's start first, we're just gonna start with faith development and this question of how children's concepts of faith develop over time. The zero to three years is actually considered a pre-spiritual development time because children can't really yet form any abstract concepts cognitively. Um, they can't really picture God. They can't really understand terms like faith and spirituality. They have a hard time conceptualizing um, a being that's not seen and present right in front of them. They don't really understand the distinction between real and not real, supernatural and natural. And that's why this is called a pre-spiritual stage. Their souls, however, need love and relationship. That's what we're created for. We are created for relationship. And relationship with a young child is gonna set the foundation for that child's later concepts of God and faith. Tom mentioned this earlier. Unconditional love is a child's, an infant's even, earliest spiritual need. And that is met through their relationship with you, the parent. It's in infancy that later spiritual um, development finds its foundation as children start to develop a sense of belongingness and self-worth. In infants, in, in infants experiences are going to set the stage for trust in relationships. And their experience with the world is primarily a sensory one. So as young children, as, as infants, um, toddlers, we experience and make sense of the world around us tactilely. How do we fit into this space? What happens when I drop mom's keys? Um, it's all about us interacting with the world in a physical way and what we witness from how we interact with the world in a physical way. When I touch this ice, it's cold. Um, this lollipop is, is sticky and sweet. Uh, when I bite my big brother, he yells at me. So in infancy and into early childhood, the child's primary needs are based on safety and attachment and are relationship focused. And they um, experience things physically primarily. So it's really important in all those interactions with them that you transmit love in everything that you're doing. You respond lovingly and you continue to build trust with them. Then as they move through infancy, they're able to develop their understanding of themselves as being separate from you. Because before six to nine months, kids don't even realize that if something's outside of a room, it still exists. Now, past nine months, they start uh, recognizing that. And some of you who've got babies now know what happens when mom leaves the room and baby only wants mom. They go through that phase, right? It's because they've suddenly realized that mom continues to exist even though she's in the kitchen. And if I cry a lot, she'll come back. They're learning that cause and effect. And those experiences help them to develop trust. Now, as they get a little older, those terrible twos, right? autonomy and assertion of the individual begins to emerge. And that can challenge a lot of parents. We talk about the terrible twos, it actually starts about 18 months. Um, but in early childhood, that toddler needs consistency and love so that they know when to assert themselves and when to acquiesce to the parent. Being self-centered or self-oriented is totally and completely normal for this age because they don't really even have the cognitive ability to take someone else's perspective. You know, I, I've seen parents sometimes ask their littlest ones, you know, how do you think that made them feel? And I just kind of chuckled to myself. I'm like, they got no clue how that made someone else feel. <laughs> the third grader might not even really think about how something makes someone else feel, right? Kids at this age are very, very self-centered um, because they don't know how to take someone else's perspective yet. They also have a tendency to judge the severity of a misdeed by your reaction. So when you overreact to something, say spilt milk, 
they're going to think it's a much bigger deal. And so your reaction and your responses to them, it's hugely important in their understanding of their own self-worth even. So let's, let's take this um, back to the faith development part now. First and foremost, it's important for you to help your children understand um, that God is a loving father. And you do that through your interactions with them. Um, there was a 20th century theologian, Balthazar, and, and he wrote rightly that young children cannot distinguish between parental and divine love. And that's so true. It's up to the parent to provide that model of divine love. And this is going to occur within the context of the family. The family is, so to speak, the domestic church. That's from Luminum Gentum. And, and that means that it's within that context of the family that we first learn who God is and that we prayerfully seek his will for us. Again, this reiterates the importance of that first relationship between you and the young child, if they don't feel loved or safe with you, then they're going to have a really hard time conceptualizing God as a loving father who protects and loves them. Now, as the kids get a little bit older, let's say three to seven time frame, that's actually considered stage one of faith development. Keeping this in mind is really important, especially as they approach age seven. Age seven is like this magical age. Um, it's considered the age of reason. All sorts of amazing stuff starts ha happening cognitively around age seven, um, both cognitively and emotionally and socially. It's during the, the preschool prior to age seven um, time frame that a child's conception of faith starts to mirror the family's faith. So what you do as a family in that three to seven time frame has a profound influence on that child's growing faith because you're modeling for them what is normal, what love looks like, and what faith looks like. In many, younger, uh, in many ways, the younger children are going to look to you to discover what they should do and believe, and they want to do that. They want to please at this age. Unlike in middle school, now, in middle ch childhood, uh, children begin to develop the ability to really reason on a higher level. Um, sarcasm, hypocrisy, all those things start showing up. They start emerging or they start understanding relationships differently. Um, loyalty and ideals become very important. The um, humor, the ability to use humor emerges, um, but they start trying to distinguish what is real funny versus mean funny, that's a tough one. That's definitely a middle childhood social cognitive skill. And then this is when they really start to develop the ability to take someone else's perspective. The desire to conform begins to develop as kids start to balance what they want with what others really desire and want from them. In the seven to 12 age range, roughly, um, kids start to have mental representations of God, but usually it's this more mythical um, figure that's maybe patterned after those earthly relationships. Remember I said that, that that first relationship with a parent sets that pattern. So we see this emerging, but sometimes they'll, they'll have a more mythical. It's that God in the clouds with the white beard and that kind face. They, they sort of try to picture it in earthly terms. Now, explanations of faith in this grade school uh, time frame should be concrete and they should be visual because children at this age still struggle with abstract thinking. It's starting to develop though. And there's an individual pace. So, so you'll notice on my slide that's up, I actually didn't put any ages on that slide because there is a lot of individual, uh, individual difference in the age at which these things emerge. But sometimes in our attempt to explain God to kids in this middle age range um, gets complicated because we want to present a complicated model of this triune God to them. So we go with the shamrock and then we get kind of lost because honestly, most Adults don't really understand the mystery of the Trinity well enough to explain it to a spouse, let alone to a child. So when we're introducing concepts of faith to our children, it's important to give them a simple foundation and then let their questions lead you to a more 
uh, complex discussion on faith. As children get older, they will become more able to focus on more than one salient um, aspect of something. And that makes their understanding um, of the concept of, of God more complex. A young child is generally going to have a less complex and very more simplistic version of God than an older sibling who might um, be able to start understanding, for instance, that God can be both merciful and just. We need to keep the concept simple, though, as possible, and then let the complexity come from the child. It's a basic principle for good parenting in general, right? Present the idea in simple form and then grow the idea from that simple base as their cognitive skills or complexity allows. This is actually one of the best tips for when dis in discussing um, sex ed. You go very, very basic. Don't get them, go all in at first, right? Now with the older kids, when we're discussing and presenting the faith to them, it's less about what you say and more about what you do. Older kids question, and we're talking the teen years here, the tweens, they love to question, they love to push boundaries, just like those toddlers, right? And it can be a really tough time. We're going to be talking about teens a little later today in a breakout session, but for those of you who aren't going to be able to see that, I want to make sure you hear this. With your teens, discussions of faith can be more abstract or sophisticated, but the adolescent relationship with God is still really characterized as a what's in it for me or what can you do for me type attitude. Fowler called this the synthetic conventional stage for faith development as they begin to separate facts about God from previously imagined ideas about him. So wait a minute, God doesn't really have a human form in heaven with the white beard or does he because he was Jesus here on earth. So they start pulling up, um, apart some of their preconceived ideas. So as a parent, you should be open to sharing your experiences and your ideas, your personal stories with them, while at the same time recognizing that adolescence is a time when kids don't necessarily want to conform to your ideas or views or values or norms. If you can give them, though, concrete examples or times when you, for instance, felt really comforted by the Lord or um, you had just incredible experiences with the sacraments. That can go a long way for helping them to internalize their own relationship with the Lord more deeply. Pointing out answered prayers is a great way to do it. Teens also really like to experiment. Um, they are at a point in their life where they're starting to understand their uniqueness. They recognize that they're not just like their parents. They're not little clones of mom or dad. They are themselves, and it's a time when they start asking deeper and more theoretical questions like, who am I in relation to God? Why was I even created? What is the purpose of all of this? So it's important that you're accessible to them, even if they mostly just want to be in their room, laying on their bed, looking at the wall, listening to music. Those of you who have teens know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you can get them to open up a little by sharing your little God moments throughout the day, it just gives them another view and it opens up the door to their questions um, as they seek to understand God in their lives. So that's generally how um, kids' ideas of God or faith develop. They move from being very relationship focused to um, emerging autonomy where trust is really, really important they have a hard time distinguishing initially between what's real um, and uh, concrete in front of them and what is abstract. They're naturally self-oriented through most of childhood. And they move from wanting to conform to wanting to discover for themselves um, and as they evolve more complex understandings of, of faith in God. I want to switch gears here a little and I want to draw from social social cognition um, work and do like a little mini psych lesson for you guys on mental schemas because childhood thinking is and even adult thinking but but childhood for sure is based off of mental representations now we all come to understand the world around us by creating mental schemas you can think of these as like a set of rules that helps our mind to operate more uh, efficiently at drawing conclusions 
our mind is all about efficiency. It wants to look for both shortcuts and a deeper understanding of things. Uh, for, for example, children come to understand that letters represent sounds or that numbers um, represent an ordered amount of 10. So those are two different schemas. You've got a schema for letters and a schema for numbers. Um, but schemas can also be much more complex. I was explaining this to a friend recently and he was having a hard time understanding it. So I'm gonna give you a, a more complicated example. Breakfast. Now, what you think of when I say that word is gonna be highly influenced by your culture. There's some similarities, but there are also um, a lot of differences. Now, if I say to my husband, let's grab breakfast tomorrow, he's going to know the who, the when, the why, the, the, the what, the, and maybe even the where in there. My invitation, those four words, tells him that I'm hoping for a date, um, that we're going to eat a certain kind of food, that we're going to go in the morning, uh, that we are not going to have children with us, and uh, he might, in his mind, even pop out our favorite breakfast spot as a place that we're going to go. I also convey, I want to spend some time just with you in just those four words. Mental schemas are a way of being cognitively efficient, but they are greatly influenced by culture. So let's keep with a breakfast analogy. Um, many years ago, when I was in college, I went to Europe for my study abroad. And I came downstairs one of the first uh, one of the first days that we were in. I was in Germany at the time, and I was coming down for breakfast. And what I saw did not look like breakfast. Um, there were lots of meats, lots of cheeses, some hard boiled eggs, um, some loaves of bread. It definitely was not uh, pancakes and frosted flakes and Cheerios. Um, but that experience and the whole trip gave me a different idea of what breakfast was. It opened up my, my understanding that that meal can still be breakfast and it can look differently. So when we're talking about what it means to be religious or faithful or Catholic, all of that is going to be organized in our kids' minds with a mental schema. And that's influenced by those early experiences of the individual. We create a mental idea or representation of what it means to be Catholic. And our primary experiences growing up, our primary relationships set the foundation for that later spiritual growth. So as adults, when we try to strive to transmit the faith, our lived experiences as individuals for better or for worse are going to influence our idea of what it means to be Catholic and exactly what we are trying to transmit to our faith, uh, transmit of our faith to our children. The first time I went to Catholic mass, um, I went in college with some other friends and I was lost. I had grown up Protestant. I had a mental representation for what church was supposed to be like. And I will tell you, it was not up, down, up, down. Uh, the, you guys cut the Our Father off partway through. Um, there was a passing of the peace, the sweet, sweet couple behind us, you know, they said, peace be with you. And I was like, oh, thanks. And then I looked around and saw everybody else saying, and with you also. I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know the responses. And I really didn't feel like I fit in there. Your children are gonna have mental representations of church, of mass, of their faith. But we want that mental representation to be one that's not just about rules. Yes, we want them to go to mass. We want them to know how to interact there. But their understanding of church has to go so much deeper than that. As we introduce the faith to our children, faith cannot just be an internalization of rules. Relationship comes first. Their faith system has to be grounded and founded in relationships, in awe and wonder of the Lord. It has to be more complex than just the routine of mass. Although, as I mentioned earlier, it's good for them to go to mass. It is. Um, and we want them to have a positive experience of mass. But as our children grow, they have to know that relationship and relationship with the Lord is what is central because that is why we are there. It is because of our love of God that we desire to act in accordance with whatever is going to allow us to attain everlasting life with him. Love has to guide us to the obedience and the reverence. Being too rule-oriented leads children to reject the faith and its rules and its doctrine because being a Christian is hard and it's not always fun. 
And children don't want to have to be obedient to an overbearing God. They want to experience happiness. They want to have a fun lifestyle. They want to sleep in. They don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to be told that what they're doing is wrong. I actually know adults who fit into that as well. Um, they're more comfortable being comfortable than they are seriously evaluating their lives and growing in holiness and in relationship. But if we start with relationship and we start with those values and rational thought, then as our children become catechized, the rules make sense because they're in alignment with our own value system already. Research shows that one of the most important aspects of getting children involved with their faith is that they understand the why behind the rules. They understand what, why they are asked to do what they're doing. So we've got to make sure that as a domestic church, we are teaching them not only what to do, but why to do that. And that has to mean that our catechesis has to be strong and ongoing because we've got to be able to answer those questions, right? And as they get older, the questions get a lot harder. So we've got to grow and we've got to show by our actions that faith makes sense, that it's rational, that it's alive, and that the faith is there for us to continue to develop our own understanding on a deep level. But that value system, that love, that relationship that we've established in the home, that has to come first. The rules support then what we already know and believe is true. It supports what we've already established in the home. And even if our kids don't yet personally know the voice of the Lord, their mental schema of the church, of their faith, is going to be filled with people that they know personally who are good and honest and loving and trustworthy. And we can see that the church, in her wisdom, helps us to maintain a relationship with the Lord and with the, with the church militant here. But rules are never going to make us believe anything. Now, rules are necessary. Don't get me wrong. Rules provide the guardrails to keep us on the road, especially when our path takes a sharp turn and the fog is so thick that we can't see the path clearly. And we don't know if we need to stay on the right side of the road or not. Um, we don't know what speed we're supposed to drive at. Without any understanding of why we are even on the path, many of our kids are gonna choose just not to drive. They're gonna to choose to get off the road, to choose their own road, or maybe to just stop moving. Maybe they're gonna take the footpath instead, that dirt load road that leads to nowhere with no speed lanes, no lines, no one telling them they're doing anything wrong. They're just gonna make their own way. The rules we give our children have to make sense so that they'll stay on the road and they'll stay moving forward. And life is hard. If we don't know why we're doing it, why we're doing all this life, well, a lot of kids are just gonna to try to take the easier way. Your children must recognize that you have rules for a reason, that the church and their faith has rules for a reason, and those rules must make sense in their mental schema and their, of their faith life and of God. So take time to explain those with them. It's not enough to just say, because I told you so. It is, however, okay to say, I don't know, let's find out together. We have to say that a lot in our house. I'm a convert, so I've got a lot to learn still. It's really important that you provide logical explanations for the behaviors that you're asking and logical explanations for the rules, not because you have to justify yourself as parents, but so that your kids can see that you're making purposeful, intentional parenting choices. They've got to see that we're intentional about trying to keep them on that path. So I want you to take just a, um, a minute or two, and I've got some questions for you to reflect on. First, what are some of the rules that you have in your home that are non-negotiable? And then what are some rules that you have that are maybe less firm? Now, if you don't have any rules yet, because your kids are really young, what are some rules you think you might have as your kids get older? Sometimes when I, I talk to parents who have kids who are really, really young, they actually have the most opinions on what they're going to do when they have teenagers. <laughs> so take just a few minutes 
I'm going to keep the slide up for you. In our family, we have uh, rules based really in, in, in two areas. We've got safety rules and we've got moral rules. And then we have expectations of behavior as well. Um, our rules are things obviously like look both ways before you cross the street, don't give your phone number out to strangers, uh, lock up the house when, when you go to bed, uh, sit in the back seat, wear seat belts, no social media until you can show prudence and temperance, no phones if you've got bad grades. Um, and then we have expectations of behavior that are different from rules. So expectations of behavior, like be kind, be honest, be responsible, keep cursing to a minimum. That's one we're always working on. Um, and the way that children understand rules and expectations in their home is gonna influence their mental schema about rules and obedience in general. We've all heard the added rules are meant to be broken. We don't want them to have that uh, as their guiding principle when they think of rules. But one of the things that you can do here is lead by example, talk about your faith and the rules in the context of real life. So for instance, one of my kids asked me a few weeks ago why I didn't receive the Eucharist. And my first thought was, you're not supposed to ever ask anyone that, but okay, now I have to answer the question. Um, and that led to a larger discussion that was child-driven about grace and the nature of Jesus's real presence in the Eucharist. And it was done within the context of real life not a theoretical or hypothetical situation. And it wasn't a situation where I was telling him that he could not receive the Eucharist. As I mentioned earlier, our faith shouldn't ever be used as a form of punishment. And so it was wonderful for me to be able to have an opening to talk to the children about receiving um, the Eucharist and sort of the rules around that. A few days later, um, a friend of mine was having her marriage convalidated and I mentioned it to the kids as I was taking them to school. And that opened another conversation about the sacrament of marriage and about weddings. I've got, my girls are, are nine and 13. So they love thinking about weddings and big dresses and uh, getting married on the beach or getting married in a church or, or eloping or whatever it's going to be. But I opened the door for that conversation just by commenting um, in one case and then in the other with the Eucharist in terms of my actions so that they could uh, pursue a conversation a little bit deeper on, on, on faith. When asked about the rules, be it in our home or about our faith, one of the ways that we can communicate effectively about the rules is by reframing them in a positive way. So, some of you have probably heard a child say, why do we have to go to mass? We go to mass every Sunday as a way of helping our family realign our priorities and to set a day aside as sacred so that we can get the rest ahead, or the rest for the week ahead. That's very different than saying, well, because the church says we have to go every Sunday. Why can't I watch that TV show? Response, we consume healthy media. We watch um, we're careful about what we watch because it influences how we view the world. The phenomenon is actually called the contagion effect. You don't have to go into all that with them, but it's, it's, it's very cool. If you read depressing books, you're going to be more depressed. If you listen to happy music, you're more likely to be happy. Um, if you surround yourself with toxic people, you're going to start having toxic thoughts. That's the contagion effect. So why can't I watch that show? Well, because what we watch influences how we view the world. Uh, when can I have social media? That's a, that's a big one in our house. Well, we only allow ourselves social media when we have a decent command of the virtues of prudence and temperance. And we have the ability and self-control to see that when we struggle with prudence or temperance, we're able to step away from that for a little bit. Uh, another common complaint, why do I have to work so much around here? That's for my kids, not for my husband. Why do I have to work so much around here? Um, we take care of one another by helping one another out when and how we can because we're part of a family and every member of this family has greatness that they can contribute. So that's what I mean about uh, reframing some of, those, some of those rules, some of those practices in a family in a positive way 
that uses rational thought without strict obedience as the goal. So before I go on, I want you to look at those rules that you wrote down just a couple minutes ago and take just like 15 seconds to reframe your rules in a positive light. Because if you're really gonna be able to, under, to explain these rules to your kids, you wanna do it um, in a positive way. All right, now let's switch gears just a little. If you didn't get to it, you can do that as your homework. Um, now that you have a basic understanding of how kids develop an understanding of the faith, I wanna talk about some things that parents, you can do to keep your kids solid in the faith. George Barna wrote a great book about 10 years ago called Revolutionary Parenting. And in it, he breaks down four things that parents did. And these are parents who had kids who then went on to practice the faith themselves and to raise their children in the faith. And there are four things that they did. They started early, they set goals, they had a unified approach, and they um, had an individual approach by dyad. So start early, unified approach, measurable goals, and an individual approach by dyad. Now I'm gonna take these one at a time. First, start early. It is really important to start early. I hope I convinced you of that by talking about the pre-spiritual stage of development. You gotta start when kids don't even realize what's happening. Um, I think of language learning. When, when kids, uh, when, when we're learning how to talk, we just learn how to talk. It just happens. Um, we learn labels for things by watching, by listening. And when kids are young, they're sponges. They just soak it all up. In high school and in college, I took Russian. How much Russian do you think I know now? I'll tell you how much. Nemnoga. That's not much. I know actually a lot more Spanish than Russian because I live in Arizona. And even though my family speaks English and I've never had a day of Spanish in my life, Spanish has always been around us. So now the Spanish I speak is no mucha, but it's better than the Nemnoga, Russia. Faith like language is absorbed. And if you try to suddenly begin instruction at age seven, because you want them to receive the sacraments, I mean, great, it's never too late to start, um, but your child isn't even gonna have a mental representation of faith because you haven't introduced it. So don't wait intentionally because you think your kids are too young. Faith, mass, confession, prayers, these should all be natural parts of your day because you love the Lord and you desire to be with him. My younger kids had such a strong desire for confession by the time they actually were able to go through that sacrament because they were going with us on a somewhat regular basis and they had to just sit and wait. They saw from our, from our behavior that confession was something that we valued and they wanted it too. I can't say that's continued now that they're teens, but there's hope. So when our children were all in the toddler years, we would send them to the child care center during mass. Our, our parish was wonderful in having child care available. But generally we would send them to child care from the time that they could walk till they were about three. And by age three, they wanted to come back to mass with us. They saw that that was where the family was. That was what we talked about when we got out of, the, um, out of mass and got back into the car. They saw the big kids got to go and they didn't wanna be left out. Going to mass was part of our family culture and they wanted to be included. So start early so that it's just something natural that is happening with your family. Second, um, Barna's work found that families that had a unified approach, meaning both parents um, together thought that the faith was important. Um, those families were more likely to transmit the faith successfully across generations. If you don't both think that the faith is important, it's very hard to support one another's goals and it's very easy to undermine what your spouse is doing. For example, if you think confession is a waste of time and your spouse thinks that you should go monthly, well, finding time in the schedule to do that is probably gonna be a little more difficult. If you sleep in on Sundays and your spouse is taking the kids to mass, well, you're sending the message that mass is not important. No matter what you say, your actions undermine what your spouse is trying to do. So having a unified uh, approach as you set goals for your family 
is really important. Regular strategy sessions with your spouse is a great way to achieve this. As kids get older, you can do family meetings, um, but it does get a lot harder to sit around that table um, on a regular basis with the busyness of schedules. But find a way to communicate goals and revise them and work as a couple and then as a family. And as you develop your approach, remember that developing a Catholic culture has to start with Jesus at the center of it all. So what does that mean for you to live life, um, to live your life as a disciple of Christ? Well, what we do as Catholics looks different than the rest of the world, right? We act differently. We do things differently out of love for Christ. Our obedience to the Sabbath, for instance, our appreciation for the sacrament of reconciliation, that comes from our desire to love and please the Lord and to remain close to him in the sacraments. If you're not intentional about what you're doing and you don't even really understand why you're doing it, it's hard to be unified with your spouse. And it's hard to transmit any authentic message of faith to your children. Remember when we talked earlier about schemas? Sharing a similar schema, having a similar understanding of faith and what it means to live as Catholic is really crucial. And that's, that's called having intersubjectivity. Intersubjectivity is a, a meeting point or an overlap of shared ideas or perspectives that emerges out of um, having an empathic relationship with someone. So intersubjectivity between a couple helps us to have a unified approach as we um, create these shared goals for our family. If you and your spouse have different ideas of what's important and you don't even realizing it, realize it, then you might be undermining instead of supporting your spouse. Now, I'm not saying that you have to have a shared mental schema um, for Catholic culture, uh, but rather that you've got to understand what one another's goals are so that you can incorporate those goals um, into your own or at least not work against them. Um, for instance, do you want them to understand the tenets of the faith and have a more catechetical, catechetical understanding? Do you want them to acknowledge and accept God and you're just going to be happy if your kids can do that? Uh, do you want them to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Is that the most important thing? Do you want them to really understand the true presence of the Eucharist? What is your goal as you're trying to transmit Catholic culture? Maybe you really want them to know the word and to be able to recite scripture. Everyone's going to have something just slightly different. So think about that, reflect on that, and communicate that with your spouse. And once you and your spouse have set, um, have communicated those ideas to each other and really um, settled on the goals, then you can work intentionally to try to cultivate that in your home. Rather than trying to get the Catholic merit badge for your week for doing that, that rosary. By the way, in case I forgot, that is your homework, not the rosary, Catholic merit badge, no. Um, rather, what is your goal as a couple for your family in terms of your Catholic culture? In Barna's research, he found that 75% of those parents who were successful at transmitting their faith uh, to their children had measurable goals to which they held themselves accountable. Um, and that was in terms of actual behavior. Okay, 75% of them had this. So you've got to set goals and then revisit those goals regularly and then check back to see if you're attaining those goals and make adjustments as needed. Father Mark Mary uh, is uh, one of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal in, in New York. And he has this great book called Habits for Holiness. And it's just out this year. I'm using it as a framework for season four of my podcast, Parenting Smarts. And in, in this book, Father Mark Mary suggests that you set goals as well, which I just love when I saw it. I was like, oh, you've been reading Barna's research, haven't you? But he suggests that we do it and we think about it in terms of the day, the week, the month, and the year. So you set goals according to the day. You're going to you know, maybe do a, a, a morning offering in the morning and, and an examine before night or weekly things. You're going to go to mass every Sunday. Maybe you're also going to add in um, a holy hour or a special Sunday dinner or maybe a little bit of extra fasting on Fridays. Uh, monthly, you do confession maybe monthly. Maybe you do a first Friday adoration as a family or maybe you do a first Friday rosary. And then yearly, you do some sort of personal retreat. Maybe you do an annual service project as a family, something like that. But you set goals according to day, week, month, and year. And that then sets the rhythm for your family life. 
There are, of course, special times of the year, Advent, Christmas, Lent, when you're going to do things different liturgically, right? But we're talking about developing a rhythm for that ordinary time, a rhythm for your family life. And it's a general expectation of foundational culture. This is not having a checklist, though. All of the things that you're doing daily to yearly are done with the goal of personally growing in intimacy with the Lord. And so for each of us, our rhythm or our routine or our patterns are going to look different and every family is going to look different, which leads us to the last finding of Barnum, who said, no, there is no one size that fits all. You've got to have an individual approach for your family, for your dyad, that mother-child dyad. For one thing, not all homes have parents committed the same level of celebrating the faith. When my husband and I got married, I wasn't even Catholic. There was no way I was giving up Halloween for All Saints Day. Sorry, it was not ever going to happen. I also was not going to give up alcohol during Lent. Nope, I gave it up when I was pregnant. I'm not giving up during Lent. Things changed a little when we became Catholic. So you've got to adjust and not compare your situation to, the, to, the, to other people's families. If you internalize other people's goals and objectives and practices, rather than coming up with your own and working with your spouse to develop something for your own family, you're going to end up in trouble. A podcast guest of mine once said that comparison is the death of self-worth. Think about that. Comparison is the death of self-worth. That applies to so many aspects of personal and family life. So you and your spouse need to set some goals and agree on some routines for your family so that you can connect in positive terms. Um, there should be some basic expectations, um, things like honesty, cleanliness, concern for others. Those are going to be one size fits all. All homes should have basic expectations, right? And those are gonna be irrespective of the individual child's needs and gifts. Those are the one size fits all. Some things are just good all the time. It's always good to show kindness. It's always good to show generosity, right? A little good nature teasing is okay, but cruelty is not, right? Those, those are universals. That said, back to this idea of being in, having an individualized approach. We've got to have a somewhat differentiated approach to parenting because our kids are wired differently with different skills, different talents, different areas of struggle. They were created for a unique purpose in this world. So we've got to meet each child where they are while keeping consistent rules for the family still. You've got to take time to tailor your parenting style to each child, and that will help you remain in relationship with them as you grow and as your relationship grows. This isn't just being effective um, for things like getting them to eat their vegetables, right? Tailoring your approach to your child helps them to actually grow in their relationship with the Lord as they get older. One of the characteristics of families that had successful transmission of their faith culture is that they practiced a core philosophy that children should be encouraged at a pace that is natural for their, for their own child. And that should be done even when others disapprove of it. You cannot worry about how other people are going to judge your parenting because you are the one responsible for your child, not them. God has ordained a path and a purpose for each child. So you've got to have an individualized approach for each of those children. And that is going to help um, your child to understand that they are created uniquely for a special purpose in this world. We would not expect the same uh, skills or talents from a child who's going to become a doctor than one who's going to become a concert pianist or a dog breeder or a parish priest or a police officer or a Dominican sister. So we shouldn't push them to be little clones of each other. Just because the oldest might have gotten straight A's or was a primo artist, that doesn't mean all the other children are going to follow suit. So as we do this, we've got to remain in relationship with our children, be hands-on parents, but be careful not to hover and smother. And this is a tough one. Now, 80% of Barna's parents who had children remain solid in their faith said that they were heavily involved in every aspect of their child's faith life. They partnered with their child in every dimension. So rather than trying to limit their involvement as the kids got older, they really partnered with them. And the difficult struggle here is parents becoming too involved, too smothering, too helicopterish. Smith, a researcher at University of 
uh, Notre Dame published a book a few months ago called Handing Down the Faith. And it's based on research collected in 2014 and 15. And along with his colleague, he writes, too much or too little social, too much or too little religious socialization by parents tend to undermine the transmission of religious faith to children. They found that when parents were weak or inconsistent, their children tended to be apathetic towards the faith. And when they were overbearing on the other hand, children tended to distance themselves or rebel completely. So there's a balance you've got to achieve. When parents talk too much or make demands without explanation or are controlling of topics or conversations, that's when it backfires. So you've got to have a balance that's achieved between providing and promoting a culture of prayer and faith in the home, but not being too authoritarian about it. You're fostering a relationship with the Lord. You're not forcing it. You're helping them to internalize something, not memorize something. Parents who remained active in the faith also uh, had parents who focused more on the um, process rather than the outcome. They were more focused on character than achievements, which actually makes sense because that's a general tip for raising kids with high self-worth. Be character and process oriented, not outcome oriented. So again, if you're more focused on pushing through to the saint of the week craft, instead of loving that time together to be creative, um, you're not doing it with the right headspace and it's not gonna work. Be process oriented rather than outcome oriented. And that will help, your, help you to let the kids make their own mistakes. So looking at that last slide again, is there one of those areas that you do well? that you can like give yourself a little star for? And is there maybe one area where you could be more intentionally focused on doing better? You know, one of the things that we try to do as parents is to help our children to develop the ability to make good choices in all areas. And sometimes that means we've got to let them make bad decisions and let them deal with the natural consequence so that they see what happens when they make mistakes, when they bend or break the rules. Because kids learn through the process, even when the outcome isn't what they wanted. And it's not just reserved for older kids. We should be trying to let our little ones do things, make mistakes, learn, and adjust. Someone once told me, um, little kids, little problems, big kids, big problems. Let those little kids make those little mistakes and help them out when they do. Help them see that your love is not dependent upon their perfection. Your reaction, your acceptance of them and their imperfections, your love for them, your desire to see that good, that's all again a template for them understanding that loving and forgiving father. You restore a relationship with them when it is ruptured by their behavior. And you've got to lay down some laws, yes, Again, those rules should not be oppressive. They should be sensible. And as kids get older, it becomes even more important that those rules are sensible because they will challenge you on it. Those rules um, should be enforced by both parents consistently also. There's a great little book called The St. Benedict for Busy Families. And in it, Father Dwight Longnecker, it's a great little book. He discusses the importance of providing consistency for children as they grow. Barna's work also found consistency was really important. And this doesn't mean that you treat your 16 year old the same way you, you treated him when he was six, because we've got to let our children and our relationships grow, right? But it means that you can have an individualized approach and still be consistent with them. Having stability and consistency also means that you're not always striving for the next best, better thing. You're not grasping for that next best job or that bigger house or the better soccer club. You're fostering contentment. Your marriage roles should also be stable and consistent. You should be reliable to your kids and to your spouse, and you should expect your children to be reliable um, as well. So again, to reiterate, before I go on to this last section, you want to start early with your kids in terms of introducing the faith. You want to have an unified approach with your spouse. You want to have measurable and goals that um, you can um, help hold one another to be accountable for. 
You want to have an individual approach by dyad, and you need to be consistent. So when we talk about transmitting the faith, I want to move in to address the idea of what it means to have a uniquely Catholic culture. There are a lot of really good, beautiful Catholic families that are amazing at liturgical living, um, but they haven't yet even taught the kerygma to their kids. So what is the kerygma and why is this talk entitled kerygma? Kerygma is a Greek word that means proclamation. In his book, Clear and Simple, Andre Rainier breaks down this proclamation of the gospel in a really easy way to understand with the four R's. He talks about rupture or relationship, rupture, restore, and response. We are created by God for relationship with him. If your child knows nothing else when they leave your home, let it be that essential fact of life. We are created for relationship with the Lord. I don't care if they can't boil water or if they can't do a load of laundry and they don't know how to fold a fitted sheet. They need to know whose they are. They were created intentionally, purposefully by the creator of this universe for the purpose of knowing him, loving him, and serving him. They were created for relationship. And you teach your children this fact by telling them over and over and over and over again, a hundred different ways. You tell them that you love them and you are so glad that God created them to love and be loved. And as they grow, it becomes one of the most natural things in the world for them to understand. I'll quiz my youngest one now sometimes. Hey, why did God make you? That very fact that we were created by God for love and for relationship reinforces everything that we want to believe. We want to believe that we're worthwhile, that we're lovable, that we're good, that we're important. And your kids do too. It gives our life meaning because we want to be in relationship with him, we want to serve him, and we want our actions to bring him glory. My parting act, uh, words for my kids when I drop them off for school every day or, or say goodbye to them uh, is bring God glory through your actions. We are created for a relationship with God and what we do in our own life reflects that nature of the relationship. We either bring him glory or we bring about our own shame. And sometimes we do bring about our own shame, which brings us to rupture. Because of original sin, our relationship with God is ruptured. Sin came into this world because of the choice of man. And even though we've been restored in baptism, we still do have a tendency towards sin. But our relationship has been restored through baptism because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So our kids need to know that they are made for a relationship with God. They need to understand that they will make mistakes. We fully expect them to make mistakes. And they will sin because that relationship was ruptured by sin. And the relationship we, that we have with God continues to be ruptured when we sin. But the good news is that God became man. That man was Jesus Christ. And he lived and taught and dwelt among us and took upon all of our sin, our past and our future sin, all of it. On himself when he was sacrificed so that we can be restored to new life and be with him. The story doesn't end with sin and rupture, but rather we are restored and our relationships are made new. And our kids give us a lot of opportunity to talk about rupture and restore. It is something that you probably could do on a daily basis many times a day. I know I could. You told me you had cleaned your room already. You lied to me and broke my trust. Rupture right? And then we need to restore that relationship. Don't hit your sister. Now apologize to her, okay? Rupture, restore. What just broke? Do you need help in there? Right? Rupture, restore. Over and over and over again. Kids learn from making mistakes. Some mistakes are big ones. Some mistakes are little ones. But the restoration of the relationship after the mistakes is essential as a family. Now, the last essential component of teaching our children about God is helping them to understand that they have an active role to play. And we call this response. We talk about relationship, rupture, restoration. Here's the response part. This is a continual thing. This is not just a one-time thing. Living a life of Christ is not just about receiving the graces, right? We have to act too. 
We have to respond. We have to renew that yes to him in all the hard little choices that we make on a regular basis. So as we strive to effectively transmit the faith in our homes, we need to be focused on those four R's because that is the basis of the foundation upon which the rules and the doctrine and the dogma are. We focus, if we focus on the rules as the foundation for our faith, our children are gonna push away because it's just too restrictive. Our faith, our Catholic life gives a structure and a guide for us to continue to say yes to him, right? That response as we search for ways to grow deeper in relationship with the Lord. But if we don't have that relationship first then we don't have the reason for the rules, why go to mass if you don't even believe in God's presence? Why save yourself for marriage if you don't believe that you were created with dignity? Why tell the truth if you don't really care about being in relationship with others? If there's no reason for the rules, there, if there's no reason for the rules, then you don't have um, the relationship, right? Many of us, uh, many people who think of Catholic culture think only of living liturgically, and that makes me insane. We need to be thinking about living in relationship with the Lord. If you do all these liturgical living things and yet you fail to cultivate love in your home, your children are gonna see right through you. You will be a big religious hypocrite. Matthew 23, 28 says, so you too outwardly appear religious to people, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. All that doing, all that business, those rules, going to mass, going to adoration, getting smacked upside the head because you were laughing, giving our kids the death stare during the Our Father because we know that they're squeezing their siblings' hands too tight, right? Maybe you light the Advent wreath. Maybe you say the rosary with your kids. Maybe you celebrate a feast day, but you fail to live with love in your home. One of the primary reasons children leave the faith is hypocrisy parents who are not practicing what they're preaching. And anybody with teenagers has probably experienced being called out as a hypocrite, because a lot of us are. Now, I converted to the faith in 2007, and it changed my life. Because I encountered for the first time the true presence of the Eucharist, our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And I get to do that every day now. It's amazing. Our lives as Catholics is sacramental. We have the true presence of the living God. We have the ability to meet him in the confessional and seek absolution when our relationship is ruptured. We get to meet him in the Eucharist. And the sacraments keep us on the path of holiness. They are not just milestones or markers along the way. They are not a way to live liturgically and just check a box. Frequent participation in the Eucharistic feast helps us to grow in virtue. It helps protect us from vice. Participation in the sacraments is a check, as a box checking activity though, without any understanding of Jesus and the grace in our life, without a relationship with him. Well, it's just going through the motions without making any progress. St. Teresa of Avila is my favorite saint. And she has this quote, if you wanna make progress in the spiritual life, the important thing is not to think much, but to love much. And so do that which best stirs you to love. You know, sometimes as parents, we try to complicate things. And in the process, we lose the message. We use too many words. As I draw to the end of this talk, you're probably thinking, yeah, Dr. Hackett, you use a lot of words. But we need our kids to understand the kerygma first and foremost, before anything else. That we were created by God to live in relationship with him. And that relationship was ruptured by original sin, but restored through the life and death of Jesus Christ. And God is inviting them back to relationship every day, every moment to live with him. To me, everything we do in our home should be focused on transmitting that message. That has to be the core of what we do as a Catholic family. Being Catholic is about living in relationship with Christ. Gregory Popkak says the primary task of parenthood should be to raise children who are able to give and receive love. It sounds pretty simple. Learning to pray the rosary is great. Learning the saints is great. Learning memory verses is great. But without love, that is gonna mean nothing. I like revolutionary parenting, the work of Barna and the work of Smith and his colleagues because they underscore the importance of the foundation being set within the home and then being reinforced in the church. The church reinforces what is happening in our household. 
and the decisions in the household are made with love. Love is the center of it all. And from love comes both obedience and freedom. We as parents take our guidance from the mother church. We know what the rules are and we know that they're good for this, our spiritual good to help keep us in full communion with Christ, to help us to best be able to receive his grace. But within the home, our children are gonna take their direction from us. We are their spiritual leaders. If we don't have a healthy relationship with them, don't expect them to have a healthy relationship with the Lord. If our home is a place of distress as they're growing up, don't expect them, want to mirror, them to want to mirror that as adults. The church is that place that will hopefully give them comfort and peace when they grow up and they're away from us. The church can be that place where they re, that remains constant for them when their other aspects of their lives is changing. And again, I wanna make sure that if you leave here with one understanding, it is that none of this matters unless you have Jesus as central to everything. Routine and doing good things is important. Living a life of love and sacrifice and devotion to the Lord, that is so great. Love the Lord, love your children in a way that they can see that love tangible. Help them to understand the love of the Father by being a good and loving parent now. And as your children grow, give them space to grow. Have conversations based on reason and your own faith experiences, not just a list of rules or activities to be completed. Support your spouse in his or her spiritual growth and have a unified approach to your faith. Teach your children individually that they were created to love and be loved by God who gave his life for them out of love so that they could share eternity with him. Love them deeply and guide them gently. Let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, thank you, Lord, for the gift of this time together and for guiding us in this most important role. Help us to work with your will, to get out of the way when we need to, to lean in when you call us, and to listen to your voice. Help us to be an example to our children and yet remain a child with you, forever looking to love and please you as we seek to serve you through our love for these children that you have given us. Let our mornings begin with you, our days be of service to you, and our nights bring us home to you for restoration. We ask all this through the intercession of St. Joseph and the Blessed Mother. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Later today, I'll be recording another session about Gen Z. That's going to be your tweens and teens. So check back later for that presentation because I'm going to be presenting some Gen Z specific research on what's going on with this age group and what they in particular need, um, specifically things about um, us learning to surrender um, them and build greater trust and support as they go into the double digits. If anyone has further questions about parenting stuff, come to the Q&A session, um, send us a comment, and um, you can meet me on Instagram. Um, I'm there more often than I should be, um, but I love connecting with folks over there as well. So it's the name of the podcast is Parenting Smart, the blog, Parenting with Peer Review, and you can always find me at Instagram, Mary Ruth Hackett. Thanks a lot.